Uh, I want to share with you today something uh, very simple. I, I don't believe I've ever uh, uh, preached uh, uh, using a, a text the way I'm going to use it today. Uh, just a little bit of a different thing. And I, uh, but but sometime back I began to uh, pray about uh, this particular aspect. And so I'm going to look at one verse of scripture today. You say, "Oh boy, be a great, uh, be a short sermon." Uh, well, not necessarily. Uh, and I also want you to realize I'm starting a few minutes later than normal, but uh, that don't mean I'm going to uh, take that time and some extra too. I'm just going to preach, uh, hopefully, what the Lord's got on my heart. And uh, and but I promise I'll I'll have no desire to keep you here lengthy just for the sake of it. But uh, but I want to share with you today something that I believe is very important. The title of the sermon is "The Struggle Is Real." The struggle is real. You know, we're, we're living in a world today where we see so many things through the spectrum of a TV or a computer uh, screen that after a while we begin to think that everything is just uh, some type of a, a storyline. And we forget about the fact that we are involved in a genuine spiritual struggle. And, uh, and I think we need to lay hold of that and grasp that reality. And so Ephesians 6.12, we're just going to look at one verse. One verse today. Let's stand together as we read Ephesians chapter 6 and, uh, and verse number 12. The Bible says this, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to be here today. And I pray, O oh God, that Lord, you would just, Lord, just lead this time by the power of the Holy Spirit. Help me, Lord, to preach exactly what I ought to preach. And dear God, open the hearts and minds and the ears of every individual. And Lord, may we not only hear your word, but may we be willing to act upon your word as well. And we'll thank you for it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. I'm actually going to focus primarily on the first part of the verse uh, today. But I want you to understand all of this is applicable. Okay? Our battle is against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We need to understand that. Listen, I, I believe this with all my heart. You don't have to agree with me. You have every right to be wrong if you like. But uh, I believe that all of this political mess that is going on with all the protests and all of the, the, the insanity, at the heart of that problem, it is a spiritual problem. He said, oh no, it's just politics. <laughs> I, I got news for you. There is some kind of spirit that's running some of these politicians and it's not necessarily the Holy Spirit. Let's just go ahead and face reality. We're living in crazy times. We need to understand, we're, we're in a real struggle. The struggle is real. Now, you know, I, the, the word wrestle here is in this uh, portion. And you know, uh, in, in my earlier years, in my youth, wrestling was a sport that I absolutely loved. At one point, uh, as a teenager, I was, uh, I was taking uh, judo, jujitsu, wrestling, and boxing. And, and I loved all of them. I mean, that, that, was, that was great, great stuff. And the interesting thing is that I found out is the fact that uh, wrestling was greatly aided by the judo and the jiu-jitsu that I took. Now you say, well, what's the difference between judo and jiu-jitsu? Well, judo is strictly a sport. 
Okay? Uh, they have that at the Olympics. It, it's just really a sport. You're not trying to hurt anybody. You're just trying to defeat them. And, and you know, it's sort of a, it's almost gentlemanly like you bow before you go into your match. In jujitsu, you learn how to use pressure points, you learn how to choke, and you learn how to break bones. It's a little bit more intense if you can figure that out. Okay? And then, of course, just boxing was boxing and, and, and wrestling was wrestling. But uh, the fact of the matter is, I used to love to wrestle. Now, the style of wrestling that's done in high school and college and in the Olympics it is a whole lot different than what you see on television on the WWE or whatever it is. Okay? Uh, now, I used to like to watch wrestling way, way back when I was younger. My favorite guys to watch was, uh, now I'm going to date myself and some of you maybe never even heard these names but I used to love to watch Eddie Graham and the great Malenko the great Malenko I mean there he was he was he was a foreigner he was I think from supposed to be from Russia and the truth of the matter is he was born in Macon Georgia <laughs> but buddy they could put on a show they could put on a show then Dusty Rhodes come along, the, the, the American dream. And I remember when Dusty Rhodes first hit the scene, he was a bad guy. And then somewhere along the line, he picked up an American flag and started waving it one night. The crowd went wild and he became a good guy and was the American dream from there on out. Amazing. Now, that, that, that's not wrestling. That's a show. <laughs> okay. Real wrestling... Does not, uh, it is not just a display for entertainment with predetermined results. And, and by the way, you go back to biblical times. Wrestling was uh, something that w was carried out. And in many cases, the match was determined by who lived and the loser died. Now that's serious wrestling. You with me? So when the Apostle Paul uses this terminology, it's, it's very crucial to look at it in, in its right context. And so, you know, we need to understand something. The struggle that we're involved in is real, so what we need to do is we need to seize our opportunity with purpose. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at the first part of this verse, but I'm going to look at it. In some cases, word by word or phrase by phrase. So stick with me here. Point number one. It says, for we. Now just stop right there. For we. You say, preacher, I don't get where you're going. Stick with me. Okay. For we. This is an all-inclusive reality. We are all involved in this thing. It says, Paul didn't say, for I wrestle not against. He didn't say, for the disciples, or the apostles, or the pastors, or the missionaries, or the Sunday school teachers. He didn't say it was just a select group that was supposed to be involved in this thing. He said, for we... All inclusive. You know, th here's something that we need to understand. Each of us have a role to fill that nobody else can fill quite like we can. You know, a, a great illustration is in John chapter number 21. There was a little bit of rivalry, apparently, between Peter and John. They were both disciples, followers of Jesus. Both of them had a very special, close relationship with Jesus. They were both part of what we would consider the inner circle of the disciples. But apparently there was some rivalry. And, and Jesus had been speaking to Peter and, uh, and, and, and giving some very uh, straightforward comments about his future. And notice what happens here. Verse 20, it says, Then Peter, turning about, seeing the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, that's talking about John, by the way, which also leaned at his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? Now, Jesus had already been told him, this is what you're going to do. Well, then he looks over and sees John. He said, well, what about him? 
What's he going to do? And what did Jesus say? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that, I, that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow me. He was saying, hey, it doesn't matter what he's going to do. You just be faithful to what I have called you to do. You do what you do, he will do what he will do. As long as you're both committed to me, you're fulfilling your purpose and everything is going to be fine. But we got to understand, we've all got a job to do. None of us are to be mere spectators. Now, I, I, I don't want anybody to misunderstand. This is not a criticism. I enjoyed our choir singing today. Amen? Enjoyed it. Loved it. I, I love it when the choir gets up and sings and they just move my soul and stir my spirit. Man, that is a good thing. Amen? But let me tell you what I think is, is a danger if we're not careful. And I say this about, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Christian movement at large. Modern worship has in many cases been cursed by the desire for nothing more than spiritual entertainment. Now listen, do I want to hear good music? Amen. Do I want to hear people hitting the right, uh, the right notes in the right keys? That's a blessing. Amen. I've heard a few specials in my time over 40 years of being a pastor that I would sit there and pray saying, Lord, let it end quickly. Because <laughs> I've heard some that, oh my soul, they hurt. <laughs> and I've heard some that were an absolute blessing. Amen. You know. But I got news for you. If all we do is learn to get spiritually entertained, but it doesn't move our hearts into a closeness with God, then guess what? That's not really worship. You with me? You understand what I'm trying to say? You see, worship needs to be a personal reality that we share with others. Colossians chapter 3 verse 16 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Listen, we all all are involved. Nobody is supposed to be just a spectator. Nobody can come in and say, well, I ain't going to do nothing. I just come to watch the show. That's not God's design. He's got a purpose for every one of us. So, for we. Alright, next point. Let, let's expand it a little bit. For we wrestle. We wrestle. You know, one thing I learned about wrestling a long time ago, you, there, there's no such thing as wrestling long distance. <laughs> I mean, wrestling is up close and personal. You reach out and grab a hold of your opponent. And in some cases, hold on for dear life. I probably shouldn't tell this story, but it was so funny uh, back when it happened years ago. Uh, the, the school that, that we had down in Florida that I, that I ran for about 18 years, uh, we still did something. And, and by the way, statute of limitations are over, so call the law. They can't do a thing. Okay? I used to paddle kids when they got out of line. I mean, I had a, I had a, a nice paddle that I used. Uh, it, it, it was a, a beach ball paddle. You ever seen one of those? I mean, can't hurt you but sting like fire. I broke several of them. Uh, uh, anyhow, but uh, at any rate, uh, uh, one day, never will forget it. I was out there getting ready to have a football practice. And all of a sudden, I saw this one kid named Jeff come running out of the building, and he had my paddle in his hand. Following him was a whole bunch of the guys on the football team and they're running at me full blast. And I think to myself, this is not good. I knew exactly what they planned to do. They planned to wrestle me to the ground and they were going to use the paddle on me. Never will forget it. 
Here's Jeff, buddy. He's the ringleader. He's the troublemaker. He's got the paddle. He's coming. And so, man, they come all rushing up around me. And the only thing I could think to do was I reached out, grabbed a hold of Jeff, threw him on the ground, fell on top of him, took my hand and grabbed his belly and started squeezing as hard as I could. And, and you know what? <laughs> he's, all of a sudden, he's there hollering, ah! Help! Help! He's killing me! Get off! We give! We give! Now the only reason I won that thing is because, buddy, I was willing to get up close and personal with the guy that was heading the charge against me. Listen, we need to understand something. We're in an up-close, personal, spiritual struggle. And just because you get victory today, guess what? The devil will come back tomorrow. And the next day, and the day after that, and you're going to have to be willing to get up and personal and stand for Jesus each and every day. Listen, Satan will use our individual flaws and struggles against us. And by the way, everybody in this room, you know, isn't it, it's always amazing to me, uh, at church, and by the way, I, I believe we ought to do our best when we come to God's house and come together, you know, for worship. Don't misunderstand me. But you know what? We all put on this persona when we come to church. Bless God. Amen. Hallelujah. But we may not always be like that on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. Particularly if your team's not winning. Okay? Might be a little bit different. Listen, the devil knows just exactly where our flaws are. He knows exactly where to poke and where to dig and where to put the pressure points. I mean, to get our attention. Listen, 2 Corinthians in chapter number 2 and verse 5. Uh, I want you to catch this because this is rather intriguing what the Apostle Paul writes. Verse 5 it says, But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. Uh, this was a guy that had gotten out of fellowship with God and they had to deal with. He he says, so that contrary wise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. He was saying, hey, that guy fell. The guy messed up. Don't look down your nose and kick him when he's down. Love him and help him get back up again. What a novel thought. Verse 9, For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you were obedient in all things. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Now catch verse 11, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. The devil knows our flaws. And he uses them against us. And you know what? We're not struggling for a show, but for mastery. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse 25. I love this passage. It says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now, verse 26, it's interesting. He says, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. You know, we're not struggling to put on a show. We should be struggling to come out on the, on the victory side. You know, sometimes we put so much emphasis on, 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 the, on the show aspect. You know, I, I used to really enjoy watching professional boxing. I haven't watched a boxing match now in years. But I used to really like it. I remember back in the days when George Foreman was just first getting going. I used to love to watch George Foreman. Okay? I mean, he, he was something else. But uh, I remember in one of the early matches, he was I don't even remember who he was fighting, but he was in the ring with this other guy. Boy, this other guy, man, he had the footwork. Man, he could, he could dance around. He could do all this stuff. And man, he was just going around and George Foreman just sort of standing in the middle of the ring, just following him around. And this guy was here, man, he was... <laughs> 
doing his jabs and everything else and dancing. Man, looked good. He could do all kind of shuffles. And man, he, he was just going all the way around George Foreman until all of a sudden George Foreman just went out and went, BOOM! And that old boy went down and didn't get up. Match was over. Now, that old boy knew how to put on a good show, but he didn't know how to punch. George Foreman didn't have much of a showmanship, but buddy, when he connected, things happened. Listen, we don't get points on style. We get points on, are we focused on Jesus and hanging on to Him? So, first point for we. Second point, for we wrestle. Third point. Now here I'm going to sort of take a little bit of a U-turn or, or, or a sideways turn for a moment. For we wrestle not. I, I, I fear there's too many of us that have sort of gotten stuck right there on that point. We're not wrestling. We just not do it. You see, no one is ever going to claim the victory if they refuse to engage the enemy. You're never going to win unless you're willing to take on the enemy. And those who refuse to wrestle accept the bondage of defeat and slavery. I remember in our school that we ran for, for one year, I decided I was going to teach our boys how to wrestle. After we got through a football season, we had sort of an open time that we didn't have anything going on. So we, we decided we would rest. And we actually went up and wrestled against another school up in Crystal River, Florida. Beat the socks off of them. It was wonderful. Uh, but uh, anyhow, w w and I was teaching the boys how to wrestle. And I had some of my guys that were pretty good athletes. And I had some of my guys that, that looked like they had not hardly ever gone outside and gotten dirty a day in their life. Now, we didn't have a mat. We didn't have anything like that. We wrestled in the grass. It's what we had. Plenty of it. Made sure we had a spot without sand spurs. That's a blessing in Florida. Okay? I had this one old boy. I never will forget it. He said, I don't want to wrestle. I said, everybody's going to wrestle. Yeah, but I don't want to. I don't care if you want to or not. Everybody's going to wrestle. Guess what he did? He got out there and as soon as I'd say, all right, go! He was in the down position. You had a down position and a ride position. Probably talking over your head. That's all right. Okay? He was in the down position. As soon as I said go, he went flat of his belly and just laid there. I said, man, what are you doing? He said, I'm just going to wait till it's over. <laughs> I said, you lose? I don't care. I don't want to do this anyhow. I thought to myself, my goodness. Terrible. But I got to thinking about it. That's where a lot of believers are today. We just don't want to wrestle. We know that somebody needs to wrestle. We know there are causes that are worth fighting for. But we don't want to get our hands dirty and get involved. Let somebody else do it. Bondage can quietly overcome us in the guise of rest and comfort, even if we're not careful. You know, I'm reminded of this. In the book of Genesis, in chapter number 49... As, as Jacob was about to die, he prophesied about his sons. And he said something pretty sad about one of his sons. Verse 14 of Genesis 49, it says, Issachar is a strong ass, couching down between two burdens. And he saw that rest was good, and the land that it was pleasant, and he bowed his shoulder to bear, and became a servant unto tribute. He said, Issachar, in the future... Your folks would rather be servants than fight for freedom. Hmm. God help us. So first point was, for we. For we wrestle. For we wrestle not. Now let me give you the last point. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You know, it says... Our, our enemy is, we're against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Let's just use a little bit of common sense. 
A spiritual foe can only be defeated through spiritual means. You just can't walk up to the devil and poke him in the nose. Because you don't see. But that doesn't mean he's not real. Amen. I may not be able to see the Lord Jesus Christ today because He's seated at the right hand of the Father. I cannot see with my natural eyes the Holy Spirit, but I know that they are real and that they are present. Our enemy, the one that we struggle with is spiritual. If we're going to overcome this spiritual foe, we're going to have to do it by spiritual means. And to do that, if you read the rest of this chapter in Ephesians chapter 6, we've we got to have the armor of God. We need to have the Word of God. We need to have the Spirit of God. We, cannot, we, we, we can't do it through just positive thinking. We can't do it by turning over new leaves. So many times I've seen people caught in, in, in terrible circumstances in their life and and there there is a spiritual solution and they say well no I, I can handle it myself and it normally ends up in disaster because a spiritual problem needs a spiritual solution wow too many times we spend too much time fighting the wrong supposed enemies Galatians chapter 5 verse 13 says this for brethren you've been called unto liberty only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now catch this, it's a very important verse here. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Bite and devour one another. You know... <laughs> The problem with, with modern day Christianity is we spend too much time fighting each other and not enough time fighting against the spiritual wickedness in high places. I heard this many, many years ago and I've used it hundreds of times since. A preacher named Al Janney said this one time in a meeting where I was present. He says the problem in modern day Christianity is whenever we need to have a firing squad, we form a circle. Now let that sink in. Let's quit fighting each other and start fighting the devil. Amen? Let, 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 let's see where our real enemy is and focus there. And, and our focus must not be self-centered. It's got to be upon Christ. Listen, this church does... I'm, I'm going I'm to blow your mind. You may not like this, and you know what? I, I hope you do, but if you don't, it's okay. We are not here to make you happy and comfortable. You say, what? Now we want you to be, but that's not why we exist. We do not exist so that I've just got a place to holler every Sunday morning. We are here to lift up the name of Jesus to a lost and dying world. It's about Him. Not about us. Let me share with you something I ran across. And I'm going to close. This is a true story. In 1898, there was a professional wrestling match held. Now this was back in the days when wrestling was real wrestling. In 1898, it was the European champion who was called the Terrible Turk. And he was going to wrestle against the American champion named Strangler Lewis. Now the event was different than what you see today on TV. It was winner take all. Okay, let out all the stops. A grudge match to the finish for the undisputed world wrestling championship. The prize was going to be $8,000. You say, well, that's not that much. Well, today's value would be over $150,000. Am I getting your attention yet? Well, in the end result, the strangler did not strangle anybody. And the Turk won. 
He demanded that his money be paid to him in gold coins. And he fashioned a belt for him to wear and he put all $8,000 of gold coins inside that belt so he could wear it anywhere, everywhere he went and brag about he was the world champion wrestler. Now by the way, the price of gold in those days in 1898 was $20.67 per ounce. He had in that belt over 24 pounds of gold. He was on a ship on his way back to Europe. The ship sprung a leak, began to sink, but the Turk refused to remove his belt. He went down with the ship and drowned because he would not take off his prized possession. The very thing that he idolized led to his destruction. Here's the point. If we think it's all about us, we've made an idol to ourselves. If we think it's all about our program. We've made an idol to that, and it will not help us win. Listen, Satan is at war with the cause of Christ and the people of God. Yet too many of us are, 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 are content to just say, well, I'm going to stay neutral. I'm just not going to get involved. Listen, you don't get involved, you've already accepted defeat. Unbelievers, by the way, if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus, you don't have a shot. There's no way in the world you can win. The only way you can win is through Jesus. The Bible says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And if you don't have Jesus, you don't have that one within you to give you power. Listen, the struggle is real. We can either enter the fray trusting God for victory, or we can just simply yield to defeat. Because we have no resistance. The struggle's real, but the Savior is mighty. The Savior is almighty. He says, hey, I, I've got it. Trust me, I've got it. But we've got to be willing to trust Him and find our victory. God help us, let's do that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you again, Lord, for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful truth that you give us in your word. And I pray, O oh God, that even now you would move by your spirit in our midst. Lord, if there's anybody here today that's never truly said yes to Jesus, may today be their day of decision. God, if you're stirring a heart today, may they be obedient to you. Dear God, just move in our midst, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.